Welcome, everybody. Uh, I can't think of a more artistic follow-up to uh, security talks than uh, Huff, because it's kind of the polar opposite. Now, if you've, been, uh, if you've been involved in any of the, let's say, compiler culture wars, you've probably heard of Huff. Uh, it's kind of off doing its own thing. It's not really a high-level language. It's just uh, you know, kind of a meme that uh, eventually you know, became um, this, this uh, popular way to go about writing efficient contracts, right? So uh, today we're going to go a little bit into uh, you know, why Huff like, why is this useful? Why would we ever want to use that, right? And uh, the answer is pretty simple. Huff, good. Thank you. <laughs> You're not off the hook yet. <laughs> so uh, we're going to go a little bit deeper. We're going to go two things here. First, we're going to do a little bit about Huff lore. Uh, so like where it's coming from, what's the history here, why does this thing even exist? Uh, and then a little bit later, we're going to go into Huff gameplay and uh, check this stuff out. So. Once upon a time, we had this guy, uh, this unhinged cryptography. You might have heard of him. Guy's name is Zach Williamson. Um, so he was doing this uh, elliptic curve scalar multiplication thing, right, for for zkps and you know all this moon math stuff, right? And uh, so he was using this precompile, and it was really really expensive, right? And so he kept asking to to make it cheaper, make it cheaper. They wouldn't do it. So he's like, all right, fine, I'll do it myself, right? Um, and so he makes this this assembler. Let's say I, I think it's a lot to call it a language. He makes this assembler. Uh, that allows you to write like really, really efficient contracts. And in this case, he did it for elliptic curve arithmetic, and it was actually faster than the precompile, right? So he actually got some efficient, uh, efficiency gains over the uh, precompile there. Now, after that, that kind of dies off, right? Uh, nobody really used it because why would you? It's kind of, uh, you know, really, really bare bones. Uh, well, then a little, a little bit of time goes by. Around 2022, um, you know, we recover the ancient Huff texts, right? We have uh, Dylan and Jet. Uh, these two guys picked this thing up, rewrote the compiler in TypeScript, uh, it kind of started getting a community around it. Then we get another rewrite by basically all of these guys here. Um, you know, rewrote the thing in Rust because it's blazingly fast. And uh, in 2023, we kind of have this Huff renaissance, right? So uh, we have like style guides, we have like aggregations of, of you know, Huff projects, we have uh, Huffathons, you know, little hackathons and stuff like that. Just a lot of, uh, of Chad showing up to come and play with this language and give it a shot, right? Uh, so that's kind of the background on like where this thing is coming from, right? So let's look a little bit into the gameplay. Now, I think uh, it's probably easier because it's so low level to start from the bytecode and work our way up rather than start at something like Solidity and work our way down. So uh, you might be familiar with this, EVM bytecode. Pretty straightforward, not very informative or useful. So let's convert that to mnemonics. Right? So this is like the uh, names of the opcodes that, that map to those bytes that we just saw. Um, still not very useful, right? This seems like kind of a pain to write, and by the way, it is. So this is sort of the bare bones Huff, right? Like the bare minimum, what, what does Huff give us, right? Uh, so the way you can kind of reason about this, right, is we have macros, they have names. Uh, in this case, it's main. The main macro is sort of the entry point to the program. Right, and uh, opcodes are read left to right, which is kind of different than uh, Yule. You know, things are evaluated uh, right to left uh, in arguments. Um, but yeah, we can read the, we can read this. Uh, sorry, left to right, typo up there. Sorry about that. Uh, then top to bottom, and essentially what these what these macros do, right, with these groups of opcodes, is they basically just copy pasta them wherever they're called, right. Uh, now, you'll see like we removed all the push keywords, right? So it's kind of implicit that if you have an uh, integer literal or like a, he a hexadecimal literal, that it's just implicitly pushed to the stack, right? We can, we can work that much out, you know, pretty, pretty basic abstraction. Um, and then all the opcodes are lowercase, right? So this is kind of convention, but per convention we do lowercase opcodes, everything else is uppercase. Uh, so this is kind of like our sugary huff. We're getting like a little bit more, a uh, little bit more into the weeds about like what this thing can do, right? So now we've removed uh, the you know literals, pretty much entirely from this macro, right? So now it's much more, uh, much more easy to reason about like what's actually happening here. Um, any constants we move it up there to the top, right? We can give it a name, and anytime we reference that in brackets, you know we just know that that's implicitly pushing that. Um, and then over here we have these little jump labels, right? And so these jump labels are basically just aliases over a place that you can jump to, right? Um, and so you can basically push these to the stack, jump to them, conditionally jump to them. Like with just that alone, you can do if statements, switch statements, you know, loops, pretty much any kind of loop you can imagine, uh, functions, if that's kind of what you want to do. And so now we're going to get more into like the juicy Huff, you know, a little bit more of uh, some of the syntax sugar and cool stuff that Huff enables, right? And mind you, this is all um, compile time abstractions, right? Like 
this, this code here is functionally equivalent to the bytecode that we saw and pretty much everything else that we've seen up to this point, right? So if you look into this a little bit more, right, we have the uh, macro calls, right? This is what's copy pasting these things up here. Uh, we have like arguments that we can give to these macros. They're referenced by the angle brackets. Um, these are called, uh, we call these like template arguments, right? And so it's just, it, it's an easier way to kind of like move these things around. You'll see with um, like Philogy, for example, rewrote uh, the WEF contract in Huff, he calls it meth. Um, but you can check that out and actually see like a lot of usage of these template arguments here and, and see just how useful that is. Um, and then we have some other things, you know, just kind of built in so that whenever you look at your main macro, it's pretty clear what's going on, right? We uh, start by loading some stuff from call data, right? We're trying to dispatch against these different um, you know, identifiers, in this case, they're jump destinations. Uh, and then if it doesn't, we yeet, right? We just throw, and um, down there is, you know, returning the value there. Now this is all right, right? But obviously this is like not efficient, right? Like if any of you have written like low-level UVM code, you're like, why are you doing all this, right? This is kind of kind of ridiculous. So next up we have froth and huff, right? It's getting a little bit more crazy now. Uh, and so what we can actually do is, aside from doing like this, this sort of dispatching and like switching back and forth, right? Uh, now, a, a little bit into the weeds on like these uh, compilers, right? There's kind of two ways that we generally dispatch external functions in high-level languages, right? So like the basic way is we just step through every single function selector and we say like, you know, do the first four bytes of this call data match, um, you know, what we're, what we're trying to dispatch here, right? And so we just like, you know, if else, if else, if else, if else, essentially, right? Um, now what this does is it uses a jump table. And jump tables aren't really a thing in the EVM yet, uh, hopefully with EOF1, fingers crossed. Uh, but for now, there's not really any such thing as a jump table. So instead, we kind of have this like hacky thing where we can take all these jump destinations up in the jump table up here, right? Um, and basically what we're doing is we're putting all of that in the memory, right? So in this case, we have uh, four jump destinations. We use up four slots of memory. Um, and then essentially what we can do from there is we can reduce that down to, um, basically reduce it down to an index, right? And then we can index into memory into one of these slots, right? Like very, very like bare bones minimum, like uh, you're just pulling a value from memory and then jumping to that, right? And by doing this, even though it costs a little bit more gas to do the memory allocation and things like that, um, it's actually pretty cool because it's constant gas. So now no matter which function you're calling, it's the same amount of gas, right? And this isn't necessarily always true in, in other languages, right? And so why, why would you even like do any of this, right? Like why, why am I even up here like talking about like this, this being a thing, right? So uh, one is obviously like MEV contracts, right? These guys are trying to squeeze, you know, like even two or three gas out of a contract and uh, Huff gives you some actually pretty, pretty obscene like optimizations over these kinds of things. Um, stateless DeFi periphery, right? So whenever you have these like uh, periphery contracts for DeFi protocol, stuff that doesn't hold its own state, um, it can kind of just be, you know, plug and played with, right? Like if something's wrong with it, we can always like take it out, replace it, uh, you know, whatever it is, because it doesn't maintain any state for us, right? So this is another use case uh, for doing something like this, is that you want really efficient, let's say like, um, like multi-call or maybe a router to like a DEX, right? You get this like really efficient uh, swapping of assets. <clears throat> and uh, most important of all, education. Right, so whenever, like personally, I first got in the Huff, I didn't really know that much about like low-level EVM. Like I, I felt that there was this like really big gap between people who write Solidity code, right, and then just like the giga chads that, you know, do like these crazy optimizations and jump tables and all this wild stuff. And Huff is an excellent way to get down into this and kind of see like how does this stuff work? Like how, what, what are the compilers doing for us, right? Like what do we get from these high-level languages? So uh, as a simple example, we have this uh, Solidity contract, right? It's pretty simple. Uh, it's a counter and it increments, you know, straightforward. We've uh, done this a million times now. And this is the Huff version. Now this looks pretty wild. It's kind of out there. There's a lot of stuff going on here, but let's just look into this really quick, right? We have a quick little function dispatcher, right? It's either going to get a count, this public variable here, or it's going to increment the count, right? So that's here. Uh, if we don't match either of these function selectors, obviously we wanna revert because what are you doing? Like, what are you calling, right? So we revert if, if it doesn't match. Um, and then from there, based on where we jump to out of this, then we can go and dive into these macros, right? So this get count and increment count. Uh, these guys are up here. So just really quick, uh, essentially like what, what this Solidity contract is doing, um, is it has a single state variable, right? And so Solidity starts at index zero, increments one for every variable with 
some minor exceptions with bit packing, but point is, uh, there's a single variable here, sits in slot zero, right? And then this increment function, what it actually does, like there's a lot of stuff happening here, but what it actually does is it loads that value from storage, it increments it, and then it puts it back into storage. So over here at get count, it's pretty straightforward. We uh, get the slot, right? In this case, we're using this uh, free storage pointer, like built-in macro. It basically behaves the same way that Solidity does. Start at zero, increment one for every invocation. Uh, so we get count, that's gonna take the count slot, we load it from storage, right? And then we put it in the memory and then return it from memory. Pretty straightforward, right? Uh, for increment count, we don't have to return it, but we do wanna increment and then put it back in storage, like we said before. So same thing, we S load it from storage, uh, push one to the stack, add one to it. We basically get the slot again, and then we store it there, right? Now there are like minor optimizations that can be done to this, but this is mostly for uh, illustrative purposes here. So as a quick comparison, this is a very, very basic contract, right? Essentially two external functions, one state variable. Um, and even just that alone, we have a pretty big uh, improvement here, right? Now, like not all of this is bad, right? Like some of this actually comes from Solidity's really important checks. Uh, for example, like at the beginning of every Solidity contract's runtime, you have this allocation of a free memory pointer, right? Now, yeah, in some cases you don't really need it, in some cases you do. Uh, but for the general use case, it's like, okay, let's, let's set up memory the way that it's, the way that it's documented, the way that everybody expects, and then we work our way out from there. Whereas in Huff, you don't really have to do this. Like, you can choose to, right? You can, you can create the same bytecode if you really want to, but also you can kind of make these assumptions if you're doing things like, uh, you know, like I said, if, if it's a MEV contract, for example, like, you don't really have to make these assumptions of like, okay, let's, let's try really hard to protect the users because somebody's gonna mess up in the UI. Right, like these things are generally used by bots, like people that um, you know have built software around this and hopefully have tested it pretty extensively. And that's tough. Thank you. Okay, uh, that was quick. Um, maybe some questions, if you like, if if there are any questions about half. Awesome talk. Um, my question is, where do you see Huff going in the future? Do you think it's going to adapt and like stay current, for example, with uh, EOF, or do you think it's more this uh, niche learning use case? Yeah. So there, there's been a lot of talk, actually, specifically about things like EOF. Uh, you know, EOF is like a pretty deep architectural change. Uh, you know, to the way that that bytecode is structured in the EVM. There's a lot of instructions that are enabled, disabled, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now. From the, from the last time that I read the EOF uh, you know, specification, the EOF and EVM bytecode formats will coexist in the same place. So, uh, you know, Huff can continue to be used in like a sort of EVM1 kind of way. Uh, but there's some discussion now about, you know, being able to target specific EVM versions, including uh, these EOF things, because there's actually a lot of really, really cool stuff that we get, um, you know, by, by doing, uh, by, by using EOF, right? Things like the, uh, you know, static relative jumps, the, uh, you know, deploy time like verification, right? Like if we can do that verification at deploy time, we can also do it at compile time, right? So we think there's some really good benefits that are com gonna come out of uh, being able to target EOF. So definitely it's, it's like under discussion now and we'd love to keep up with that in the future. More questions? Yeah. Hey, thanks for uh, spreading the gospel. Um, so one thing I really enjoy about writing Huff is uh, sort of the stack-oriented nature of Huff feels very functional. Like in some ways, it's kind of the most functional feeling EVM language, even though it's also the lowest level. Uh, so I'm curious if you think there are kind of implications for other EVM language design from this kind of stack orientedness of Huff, and if there are things we can do to maybe uh, create more expressive EVM languages by giving access to something like the stack in a higher level language. Right, so, uh, you know, right now, kind of the, the way that, uh, you know, inline assembly goes with these higher level languages, right, is uh, Viper disallows it. I think as far as I know, Faye disallows it. So Solidity is really the only one that, that does this. Um, and it's inline assembly, but it's kind of inline Yule, which is kind of like inline, uh, like, IR, right? And this is okay, like, it satisfies most use cases, right? But um, if, I, if I remember correctly, there were older versions of Solidity that used to let you get this manual control over the stack, right? So. In a sense, um, I guess from, from like a philosophical perspective, I think absolutely, if, if you're dropping down into assembly, like the gloves are off, right? Like you should have just full control of the, of the machine, right? And that includes uh, doing things like stack allocation, right? Now, this is like really tricky to actually do in principle, right? It's easy to say that, but you know, how do we know what the state of the stack is before and after the block? How can we get guarantees on that? 
right? So I think ideally in the future we will have, um, I, won't, I won't show this too much, uh, but you know, I'm personally working on a new compiler for the EVM. Um, and it's actually using a, this, this kind of principle of like we should be able to do stack-based inline assembly. Um, and then essentially just have some like declaration of like what the stack should look like before and after uh, these assembly blocks, right? Now that's like not a super trivial problem and there's cases where it's not profitable, et cetera, et cetera, right? But having that, having that option I think should always be available in a high level language. Okay, any more questions? Yes, another one. Hi, so I'm looking at this two um, you know, compiled codes, what optimization is solidly missing in order to get to what you showed? I mean, it is ostensibly like meaningful, I think, to try to figure out what did solidly miss to get to the same, because it should, right? Theoretically, yes. I think there's two things that are different here. Uh, you know, one is Solidity kind of optimizes for like the general and like reasonably secure use case. Um, you know, it's it's like uh, like the the memory allocation, the, the free memory pointer right allocation. Like that's something that it makes sense for the majority of contracts. So why not do it in all of them? Uh, now, like theoretically, you could probably deduce, you know, in, in the compilation, you know, that okay, like we're not actually doing much with memory aside from returning a value. Uh, so you could, you know, theoretically probably get some better optimizations on that. But I think the other thing here too, and I'm not even sure this is like really solvable with compilers, and this is why I think fundamentally inline assembly should always be a thing, is, um, you know, the, the use of inline assembly is derived from one of two things, right? One is just a feature isn't enabled yet, right? Uh, that's pretty pretty easily fixable problem. But the other one is um, there exists some context, some information about this this code path that you're not able to express to the compiler. Right now, now in a sense, I think you should be able to give this context to the compiler, like, "Hey, I'm not using memory. Um, you know, I, I don't really care if uh, you know this thing is checked or that thing is checked." Right. Um, so, like, you know, theoretically, you should be able to give the compiler all the um, like context that it needs to produce like functionally equivalent bytecode. But there are some cases where this just isn't possible. Right. Um, ERC 1967 is kind of an example of this. Uh, it's a very basic, like, minimal uh, proxy. It, it's I guess the specification technically only constrains the storage slots, but point is, like, it's this very minimal, like, tiny uh, contract that just takes some code, proxies it off, and then bubbles up whatever it gets back, right? But this is, like, really, really hard to do, like, sort of the optimal, perfect uh, bytecode, you know, from something like Yule, right? Because it is, like, kind of abusing, like, this, uh, like, the way that you do stack scheduling and the way that the stack remains in the EVM afterwards, so. Yeah, I guess TLDR, um, it's really, really hard to give a compiler all the context that it needs, therefore, sometimes we need Inline assembly. I have one question there for the uh, bytecode comparison. Did you use via IR to compile that thing? That was, I want to say it was via IR 200 runs, I think. I think it was the default, but with, with IR mm -hmm. on. Because uh, it, it's kind of not fair to like not compare it, or it's kind of uh, not fair to compare it to something that's like not IR, right, at this point. Because I think the, the UL IR has definitely made some like huge improvements okay, that, lately. That surprises me because the free memory point allocation, if you don't use memory afterwards, should actually vanish these days. But yeah, maybe I missed some subtlety there that we generate that makes that impossible. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, if there are no more questions, big round of applause. Thank you so much.